Take your Bible this morning, if you would, for our scripture reading. Romans chapter 1, please. Romans chapter 1. We're going to read verses 16 through 21 of Romans chapter 1. Read the verses responsibly. We'll begin together in verse 16, and then I'll read 17, and we'll alternate reading like that till we end on verse number 21. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 16 of Romans chapter 1. Ready? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And let's end reading 21 together also. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And let's pray, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading uh, of the Scripture. We're asking you, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts, that we'd be ready to receive the truth that you have for us today. Thank you for the good music this morning. Lord, minister to our hearts, and I pray it's been a blessing to you as we've sung praises to thee. I pray you'll bless the special now, Lord, to put our heart in tune with your heart and that we'll have ears to hear what you would say to each of us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. There are things as we travel this earth-shifting sand that transcend all the reason of man. But the things that matter the most in this world, they can never be held in our hand. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe Life with his great mysteries Surely someday will come to an end But faith will conquer the darkness and death And will lead me at last to my friend I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary I believe whatever the cause, 
And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to that old rugged cross. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to that old Now, Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word. I want to thank you this morning, Lord, for the Bible. Thank you that we have opportunity to hold one in our hand today and to open it up and to allow you to speak to our heart today through your word. <clears throat> I pray the word of God will be as you promised it would be, quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, and that it would accomplish what you desire in each one of our lives this morning. Please help me as I bring this message today, and please help each individual as they listen. I pray it would be a help. I pray, Lord, it would maybe answer some questions that people have had, and, Lord, it will help us all to say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. So, Father, bless our time now in the next few moments that we spend together, and I'll thank you for it. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, from time to time, I have people, and on Wednesday night, we've been having a list on the prayer guide for quite some time now of what's called unreached people groups of the world. Uh, I think we've had it almost three years on there, and we're just uh, not, not even, uh, I think we're on like the, what, the fourth letter of the alphabet. Uh, unbelievable the amount of people groups in the world that have never heard of Jesus Christ, and they have no Bible in their language. Some of them have no written language at all. And the question always comes up, well, what about people who have never heard about Jesus? What about people who've never heard the gospel? Do they die and go to hell? I mean, is that really fair? Is, is that really just of God? For someone who never had a chance? And we, 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 we ask that question. Now the good news is, I don't have to answer that question. Because God already did. And we're going to look at that this morning, okay? Now I want to make something very clear, and make sure we all understand something. That God is righteous and God is just. And I want you to understand something else. There is no other way to heaven except through Jesus Christ. Uh, there is no other way to get there. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Okay? Now, if there's some other way to get to heaven other than Jesus, what does that make Jesus Christ's statement? What does that make Jesus? It makes him a liar. And if he's a liar, he can't be the Savior. You understand? It can't be, you can't have both ways. And so, if that's not true, then Jesus is a liar and he's not the Savior. In fact, he's nobody's Savior. But the apostles said something completely different in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. They said, neither is there salvation in any other. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men. No other name, not Buddha. Not Muhammad, no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only way. But can a righteous, loving God let a man die and go to hell who's never heard of Jesus Christ? That's the question. And we're going to look at what Paul said about it here in Romans Chapter 1, is God still good? Is God still just? Is that happened? I'm going to give you four factors, all right? Four factors that affect eternity, okay? Four factors that affect what we're, the, the question we put forward this morning, all right? Notice, with you will, with you will, in Romans 1, first of all is the revelation factor. The revelation factor. 
The Bible says in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. If it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are, what church? Clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The revelation factor is this, that all men have some light. All men have some light. When, if, if the time comes and man stands before God and they try to appeal that they never heard the gospel, they never had anybody tell them in words about Jesus Christ, the Bible says here that, that they have had two witnesses. There's two witnesses when it comes to the revelation of God to people. And no one will have an excuse. The first witness is creation. That's what verses 19 and 20 talk about. And in verse 20 particularly, it, it talks about that the things from creation are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Psalm, one, Psalm 19 talks about the heavens declaring the glory of God. And so we see things, you, you, don't, you don't look at the world, you don't look at the universe and say, this all just happened. I don't, I don't look at the piano and say, wow, that's an amazing, amazing uh, you know, piece of work there. I, I'm glad that just came together one day. You, you look at that and you say, somebody made that. Somebody had, there had to be a designer here. Otherwise, it couldn't do what it does. You look at a building and you, you look at the buildings and uh, uh, driving after dinner last night and Joe was marking, you know, in, in Arizona, there's just, you know, it's like uh, the, the only difference in your houses are what color stucco would you like. Uh, it's just everything's stucco and they all look the same. There's so much, it's, it's just amazing when that's what you see all the time, to come back to somewhere like this, and I drove them through Grove City a little bit, and the different houses, the different architecture. And you don't look at those things and say, wow, I guess the lumber yard blew up one day and all these houses showed up, you know? Uh, no, you know somebody made these things. Somebody designed it and somebody built them. There was a designer. When you see creation, you know there must be creator. You see order. You see a system. You see intelligence. When you see a design, you have to know there's a designer. And that's what people have when they have creation. <clears throat> that's why the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Because you have creation that tells you that there's a designer. Creation tells you there's a God. Okay? It doesn't just happen. The second witness that we see is verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest, or manifest means made known, where? In them. For God has showed it unto them. The second witness with the revelation is their conscience. Creation and conscience. Unto them is creation, in them is their conscience. You know... Look at chapter 2 of Romans and verse number 14. For when the Gentiles, now the Gentiles would be us, okay? We're not Jews, we're Gentiles, okay? Notice, which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. These, having not the law, are a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written where? In their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. And so we have 
the, 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 the gospel, or we have the, the conscience, the, the knowledge of God that he puts in every man, uh, that, that there's a built-in knowledge of God in every individual. There's a, there's a void in every person's heart, in every person's life, that will never be filled unless it's filled with God. Nothing else will fill it. Oh, they try. They try to fill it with fame. They may try to fill it with money. They may try to fill it with popularity. They may try to fill it with all sorts of pleasure. But nothing's going to fill that void but a relationship with God. God made every man that way. That's why it doesn't matter where the people are, they will, they will have established a deity of some kind. I don't know if it's a river, a mountain, something. Why? Because it's in man that there's something greater than him. God put that in every single human being. There's a built-in knowledge of God. And I think the soul of man is restless until it finds its rest in God and comes to know Christ as their Savior. And, and, and so you, you, everybody has a God consciousness. That's what we're talking about. And so it's not just a matter of intelligence. It's a matter of morality. John 1 and verse 9 the Gospel of John 1 and verse 9 says, This is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So every man, by the way, the true light was Jesus Christ. So every man has that light that there's, that there's something uh, into the world. Creation and conscience. Those are the revelation that God gives to people, to everybody. You and I have the, the wonderful privilege, and many folks in the world do have the wonderful privilege, of having God's divine revelation. We have the written Word of God. And you know what that did? When, 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 when you heard the gospel for the first time, the Holy Spirit of God agreed in your conscience, in your heart. It, it, he spoke to your conscience. He said, you know what? This is what you're looking for. This is the truth. This is what you've been missing in your life. You need to be saved. You need Christ. And you receive Christ as your Savior. You see? You didn't fight that. You didn't say, oh, that's that. I don't need that. And, and we're going to say more about that in just a minute. But it's the revelation factor. So remember that. And the revelation factor has two witnesses. What are they? Creation and your conscience. That's exactly right. Now, let's look at the second thing, though. The second factor that comes into play here is the refusal factor refusal factor we see that in verses 21 and 22 look with me because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise they became what fools they knew God that is by creation and by their conscience they knew about God they knew God exists but they glorified him not as God Neither were thankful. And they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. All men have light. Remember, this is the light that lights every man that comes into the world. But when they refuse that light, it becomes darkness. When they refuse the light, it becomes darkness. You, can, you can't take truth and, or light, if you will, and put it in your pocket. Okay, you can't put it on ice. You lose it. You lose it. It doesn't stay the same. In other words, when, when God gives somebody light, if they act upon the light, they're going to get more light. If they refuse the light, the light becomes darkness. The light will go out. You see, in the Bible, the opposite of truth is not error. It's sin. You reject the truth, it's sin. And, and we, that's why the opposite of right isn't left. The opposite of right is wrong, it's sin. Okay? And, and, and so why does man refuse the truth? Man refuses the truth because of sin that's in his heart. That's exactly the reason. That's why you refuse the truth until you receive Christ as your Savior. They, they, they hold the truth in verse 18. It talks about when they hold the truth in unrighteousness, the last phrase of that verse. The word hold there, it means to resist or to smother. 
In other words, they're holding back the truth. They're resisting the truth. And they, they hold back the truth or they resist the truth. How do they do it? In unrighteousness. Because they they the bottom line is, I'm presented with the truth, I see what the truth should be, I know what I should believe, but I'm resisting it, I'm pushing back against it. Why? Because I like my sin. I like my unrighteousness. I don't want to change. I know that creation says there's God. I know my conscience is telling me that this is right and God loves me and God wants to, to be in my life. I understand that. I understand the truth and I'm refusing it. Why? Because if I believe that, I have to change. If I believe that, I cannot keep living the way I am. And so I resist the truth in unrighteousness. And notice what it says. It talks about then what happens is their foolish heart is darkened. What happens? The light that was there goes out. The light that was out that was there goes out. Now I'm going to illustrate it for you in another passage here in the New Testament, which is a it's a, an amazing passage. Look at Second Thessalonians chapter two. We'll come back to Romans one in just a minute, but turn to Second Thessalonians two. I want you to see this. This is this is pretty amazing. This is a frightening verse in Scripture, verses. It speaks of an Antichrist who's coming. It talks about how he's going to come after the working of Satan with power and signs and lying wonders. Verse 10, 2 Thessalonians, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now notice what verses 11 and 12 say. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. Now who's them? Them are the ones in verse 10 who received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. These are people who have light and they refuse the light. Understand? And now what's going to happen? This cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, uh, take, it, take it one at a time. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. Did, did you say God sends them a delusion? No, I didn't say that. God said that. That's exactly what that verse said, isn't it? Are you reading the same Bible I'm reading? <laughs> that is what it says. And so he says, God send them strong delusion. Well, why would he send them a strong delusion? Well, because he says he'll send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Well, why would God want them to believe the lie? He's sending them a delusion that they'll believe the lie. Why? Because that they all might be damned. So, well, God would want them to be damned? Why would God want them to be damned? Because they believed not the truth. The truth isn't something. The truth is someone, remember? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Because they would not believe in Jesus. And then, and God says, they'll be damned who believe not the truth. But why didn't they believe the truth? Because they had pleasure and unrighteousness. Why don't people believe in Christ? Why won't they turn their life to Him and, and say, Lord, save me? Because they're still enjoying the pleasures of unrighteousness. They love their sin. And they don't want to change. And God says, it'll be, it'll be over for that person. You want your sin? God is simply saying, you want your sin? You choose your sin? You reject my son? You refuse to receive him? You refuse to accept the truth? Have what you want. Have what you want. And God gives them over. Romans says he gives them over to what they want. And, and he'll, he'll let them have what they want. You see, it's, it's, it's exactly, let's, let's see if we can illustrate it. If a, uh, let's say a fella comes to church. Okay, uh, this morning, for example, in Sunday school. To say a fella come to church and our Sunday school lesson was on giving. And he shows up at Sunday school this morning and says, Ha! Those Baptists, all they talk about is money. 
Every time I go to church, they just talk about money. They want your money all the time. And you're right, we do. But <laughs> the, uh, we don't. But you understand, that, that, is that true? No. Do we talk about money every time you come to church? No. We talk about Jesus when you come to church. Talk about the Word of God when you come to church. Talk about truth when you come to church. Talk about the, how thankful we are to God when you come to church tonight. We talk about how, how there, there's a myriad of things you talk about when you come to church. But, but the problem is, is his problem is greed. His problem is covetousness. He, he doesn't want to give up his money. He doesn't want to give anything to God because he doesn't think it's God's anyway. He thinks it's all his. And you get to the root of his problem. And so he says, well, I'm never going back to that church again. All right? So he says, I'm, so, so he, listen, listen. He has light. He hears and he refuses it. Because he likes his sin. So he stays home on Sunday. Maybe his wife and kids still go to church. Who knows? And maybe after several months, he's home on a Sunday and, you know, knock on the door, and it's Jehovah's Witnesses visiting. Huh? Well, they're not in church on Sunday. They go on Saturday. So you might as well visit the people who are sitting at home on Sunday. Amen? If I was Jehovah's Witness, that's what I'd do. And he starts talking to them. He says, oh, no, I'm not right. No, wait, wait, wait. We want to tell you there is no hell. Oh, well, I think I'd like to talk to you. That sounds good to me. I don't like that hellfire and brimstone stuff anyway. Huh? And all, all of a sudden, he comes in, and, and, and you'll hear sometimes that, that so-and-so's become this, or so-and-so's believing this, and you're like, what? How'd that happen? You know how it happened? He had light and refused light, and it became darkness. That's why everybody, some of you are saying amen because you know people that believe things today that you never thought they'd ever believe. That are doing things today you never thought they'd believe. But it, and it came to a point where they had light and they refused it. And then that light became darkness. And he believes a lie. And he'll be, they all might be damned. They, some might be damned. No, they'll all be damned who believe not the truth. And that's what happens to people who don't believe in Jesus. If you refuse Christ, there's no hope for you. And light refused increases darkness. That's why Romans 1 said, professing themselves to be wise, they become what? Fools. Fools. Oh, they think they're smart, but God says you're foolish. The PhD may just stand for phenomenal dud. It may not stand for anything, anything brilliant at all. Because you have to, if you don't start with the fear of the Lord, you don't get knowledge. So, revelation factor, refusal factor. Let me give you factor number three back in Romans chapter 1. This is, a, this is the reception factor, all right? Reception. Tried to make them all ours so we could remember them. Revelation factor, refusal factor, reception factor. Here he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation, everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So here's, here's the reception factor. Light obeyed increases light. Refusal, I don't disobey the light, it becomes darkness. But if I obey the light, I get more light. Okay, that's the reception factor. It's, it's um, you see, you, most of you got saved because you didn't want to burn in hell. That's when you read the event. Sinners going to hell? Going to burn? I don't want to go there. Who in their right mind would? No, you say, I want to be saved. Now, you got saved, you accepted Christ, and you obeyed the light you were given. How many of you now understand there's much more to salvation than just missing hell? How many understand that? You know what happened? You obeyed the light you had, and God has given you more light. See, you begin to understand more things now about the Christian life than you ever did when you first got saved. But that happened because you obeyed the light that you were given. Okay? As you obey the light, more light comes in. That's the reception factor. That's why we live from faith, the just live by faith, and it's revealed from faith to faith. It's obedience to obedience. You believe the truth, God gives you 
more truth. Matthew 25, verse 29, Unto every one who hath it shall be given. Remember, that's a parable of the talents. And remember, the fella, the, the, the five went and got five more and had ten. The two got two more and had four. And then the guy had one did what? Buried it. And when God came in judgment, he took the one away from that guy. And what did he do with it? Gave it to the guy who had ten. I mean, I could hear the Americans there saying, that's not fair. Hmm? That's what we'd have said. He's got ten. How can he get another one? Well, you know why he got another one? He got more because he did something with what he had. Light brings you more life. Light will open up more life. That's the reception factor. Man, I believe if a, I believe if a heathen, I'm talking about a, or a pagan, whatever you want to call them, those who had never heard the gospel, if they'll follow the light God's given them and they'll seek to obey the light that they have, God is going, if God has to parachute a missionary in or send an angel from heaven to give him the gospel, he'll do it. Because he's wanting to obey the light that he has. I think I can illustrate it too from the Bible. Look at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Most of you are familiar with Acts 8. <clears throat> this is Philip in a great meeting in Samaria. Many, many folks are, are getting saved. And the angel comes to Philip in verse 26 of chapter 8. And notice what he said. The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of a great company under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning, and sitting in his chariot, he read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said unto him, Understandest thou what thou readest? He said, How can I except man should guide me? And he desired Philip, he'd come up and sit with him. And it talks about where he read in the scripture in Isaiah 53. And verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. You're familiar with the story, I think. And the eunuch accepted Christ as his Savior. Here's the thing. Here's a fella. He's, he's reading Isaiah in a chariot heading back to Ethiopia. What is he doing? He's got some light and he's seeking more light. Okay? Who's this talking about, Isaiah? Is this talking about the prophet? Talk, who's he talking about? Philip said, oh, no, he's talking about Jesus. God took, a, God took an evangelist out of the city, out of seeing a, a, a great number of people saved, and said, I want you to go over here to the desert. He plunks him, and by the way, he didn't say, i got somebody you talk to. I've got a divine appointment for you. He didn't say any of that. He just said, go into the desert, and Philip said, okay, I'm going. He didn't know why. He just said, I'm going. And he got there, and then he said, there's a chariot. I want you to run and get next to that chariot. That would have been a sight to see anyway, wouldn't it? Huh? Imagine the guy's kind of reading, he kind of looks out there. guy's running next to me. Isn't that amazing? But you know what? God can do that because light will bring forth more light. I don't care if he has to drop an evangelist out of the sky and drop him there. Remember what happened after the unit got baptized? Philip, they both went down in the water. Philip baptized him. When they come up out of the water, the Lord called away Philip. And he saw him no more. He was there, witness to him. I wonder if the eunuch ever thought, wow, that was something. <laughs> Where'd that guy come from? And where did he go? Huh? Just that much. But what was he doing? Obeying the light God gave him. And God gave him more light. But wait a minute. If you go just a couple chapters over to Acts chapter 10, there's another fella named Cornelius. Cornelius is not a Christian, but he's seeking God. He has some light, and he's trying to act on the light that he has. And he says he, he, he was a devout man, in verse 2. He feared God with all his house. He gave much alms to the people, alms as giving to the poor, and he prayed to God always. And then God gives him a vision. And, and, and he gives a vision of somebody coming in that his prayers have been answered and such. And he says, you send to Joppa, in verse 5, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. And he gives him the details. Well, meanwhile, he's, he's got Peter, and he's given a vision to Peter, isn't he? And he's got to teach Peter, because Peter wouldn't go to a Gentile. That would be unclean to him. 
So he gives him that illustration of the sheep with all the animals let down, saying, rise, kill, and eat. Peter said, oh, no, Lord. Imagine again, Peter's still telling the Lord, oh, no, no. Huh. But the Lord said, no, what I say is clean, unclean is clean, or unclean, or clean, you can eat. It's, it's clean. You don't, you don't argue with me. And, and, of course, that was the larger picture of these guys coming and saying to Peter, come. And guess what? Peter came and told them all how to be saved. Told them all about Jesus. See, fearing God and being saved are not the same thing. Giving to the poor and being saved, not the same thing. See, it's, 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 but he was acting on the light he had, and God gave him more light. That's the reception factor. That's living from faith to faith. And so God, God continues to open that up. Light obeyed increases light. Light obeyed increases light. You want to understand the Bible you don't understand? Then obey the part of the Bible you do understand. Then God will give you more light to understand part of the Bible you don't yet understand. Why would God give you more light to understand on the Bible when you're not obeying the part you do have light on? What would be the purpose of unveiling more of that to you? See, it's not a problem ever in our head. The problem's in our heart. Look at, look at John chapter 7, please. John, the Gospel of John chapter 7. The, the Pharisees were testing Jesus, always trying to test him and pick at him. And Jesus answers him here in John 7 and verse number 16. Jesus answered them, said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. And then he gave him a challenge, didn't he, in verse 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Do you will to do God's will? If you will to do God's will, you'll know the doctrine. See? You, you desire to obey the light you have, God will give you more light. That's the reception factor. I'm going to give you a, an illustration that I heard Dr. Adrian Rogers share. Dr. Rogers says, I was at the Space Center at Merritt Island. I was in my office one day, and a man came up in a big Cadillac parked his car, came in and said, Mr. Rogers, I need to talk to you. He was one of the big shots at the Space Center. And he says, I, I asked him, what do you want to talk about? He said, I want to talk to you about my wife. She wants to commit suicide, and I don't want her to. Well, he said, I thought that was nice that he didn't want his wife to commit suicide. You know. He said, would you talk to my wife? I said, I will if you come with her. So the two came in and sat down, and I said, well, tell me, lady, what's, what, what are your problems? And he said her problems were that man. <laughs> that man was a liar. He was a drunkard. He was an adulterer. He was a gambler. He was a blasphemer. He was a wife abuser. I mean, he was rotten. And that's mildly put. So I stopped talking to her, he said, and I started talking to him. I said, sir, I want to ask you a question. Are you a Christian? And he said he gave me a scornful laugh. Of course not. He said, I'm, I'm an I'm a atheist. I said, oh, an atheist. Dr. Rogers said, an atheist is a man who says there's no God, and he knows there is no God. He said, do you know there is no God? And he said, yes. I said, that's interesting. And then I asked him the question, of all there is to know, how much do you know? And the fellow thought for a minute. He said, well, I don't know. And then Dr. Rogers says, do you, do you think you know half? Of everything there is to know in the world, do you think you know half of what there is to know? And the guy said, well, I, probably not. He goes, well, if you don't quite know half of what there is to know, is it possible that that half that you don't know anything about, in that half could be God? And the fellow said, okay. He said, I see your point. So I guess I'm not an atheist, I'm agnostic. 
Then Dr. Rogers said this. He said, well, I didn't tell him the Latin equivalent of agnostic is ignoramus. <laughs> he said it's the same word in Latin or Greek. He said in, in Greek it's agnostic, in Latin it's ignoramus. And it simply means, I don't know, I'm ignorant. And I told him that it means, agnostic means I don't know, I'm ignorant. And he said, that's, uh, that's a, uh, he said it means you're a doubter. Are you a doubter? He said, yes, sir, I'm a big one. And Dr. Rogers says, I didn't ask what size. I just asked if you're a doubter. And then I said, what kind of doubter are you? He goes, what do you mean? He said, I said, there's two kinds of doubters. There's honest doubters and there's dishonest doubters. Which kind are you? He said, well, what's the difference? Well, he said, an honest doubter doesn't know, but he wants to know, and therefore he investigates. A dishonest doubter doesn't know because he doesn't want to know. And he can't find God for the same reason a thief can't find a policeman. Doesn't want to. Jesus said, remember, they won't come to the light because their deeds are evil. And then he asked him, would you like to find out whether you're an honest doubter or a dishonest doubter? And the man said, yes. And then he said, I want you to sign this statement. And he wrote on a piece of paper, God, I don't know whether you exist or not. I don't know whether the Bible is your word or not. I do not know whether Jesus Christ is your son or not. I do not know, but I want to know. And because I want to know, I will make an honest investigation. And because it's an honest investigation, I will follow the results of that investigation wherever they lead me, regardless of the cost. Will you sign this statement? And he said, well, I'd like to be honest. And I said, wonderful. And I said, here's your assignment. You're to go home and read the Gospel of John. But he said, I don't believe. He said, doesn't matter. You said you'd make an honest investigation. And when you begin to read, I want you to just tell God, I don't know whether this is your word or not. If it is your word, show me that it's your word. And speak to my heart. And he said, fair enough. Well, he said, I want to tell you, in a few weeks, that man came back. And he looked me in the eye and he said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he said, we got on our knees in my office and he said, he wept like a little child and wept his way into the arms of Jesus. Dr. Rogers says, that was many, many years ago, he said, I got a letter from him. He's in Bangor, Maine now. He has a tape ministry and he's teaching the Bible. And this is what he said to me. He said, Mr. Rogers, I want to thank you for spending time with this general in the devil's army. How about that? You see, the man thought his problem was intellectual. But the problem was his will. The problem was his heart. Once, once he obeyed whatever light he had, God gave him more light. And he received Christ as his Savior. So we have a revelation factor. We have the refusal factor. We have the reception factor. The last one is the reckoning factor. Go back to Romans, if you will. This time, I want you to look at Romans chapter 2, would you please? The Bible says, but after, verse 5, Romans 2 and verse 5, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. And then verse 11, For there is no respect of persons with God. Here's a reckoning factor. You know what it is? Reckoning factor is there's a judgment day coming. There's a judgment day coming. And God, God is not judging us for the sins we commit. Those sins have been dealt with at Calvary. What God is going to judge us for, believers, is light received or light rejected, refused. What did I show you and you refused it? God knows how much light he's given you. God knows how much light he's given me. Some people have far more light than other people. We have an abundance of light because we live in America. 
you have you have radio listened to, you have television listened to, you have you can get app, apps on your phone and hear the Bible and hear Bible teaching. You have we have we have it's everywhere, anywhere you want it. You have the availability of light if you like it. Bibles everywhere. It's simply and by the way, not many of you, some of you, but not many of you chose to live in America. You were born here. That was the providence of God. The providence of God that you'd be here. Now what's God's going to do? God's going to hold us accountable for the light he's given to us. Every one of us will give account of himself to God. That's the reckoning that's coming. There's a judgment that's coming. Notice Notice the verse in Luke 12. Would you look there real quick with me? Luke 12, what Jesus said about the judgment. Luke 12, look with me at, he's talking about the servant and, and, and he left him the household to take care of and then he went away and the servant didn't do what he was supposed to do. Verse number 46 of Luke 12 says, The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and an hour when he's not aware. And he'll cut him asunder and point him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, will be beaten with many stripes. What's he, wait a minute, what's he being punished for? He knew the Lord's will. He had the light, and he refused the light. He didn't do it. And then notice verse 48. But he that knew not, he didn't get that light, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And do men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Bad enough for a pagan in dark Africa or some place in China or somewhere in India where they never have heard of Jesus, refuse to live up to the light they have. And it's quite different for a person to sit in an auditorium like you're sitting in or like thousands of others across America this morning and hear the gospel preached and hear the plan of salvation given and reject the light and reject the truth. Far greater hangs on your head. The, the idea isn't, how can, what about those heathen there? The, the argument is, what about you right here? Have you received the gospel? Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? What are you going to do when you stand before God? What are you doing when God brings you to a certain point and He's teaching you something to, 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 for you to see in your Christian life and you say, no, nah, I don't care for that. The Bible, the Bible isn't the buffet at Golden Corral where you go through and pick what you want and leave alone the other stuff. This is, this is God's Word. This is what God wants for you and me. And as we get the light shown on us and we refuse it, it stymies so many other things. That's why, that's why it's so important to be baptized after you're saved. Why? You know that's true. You know that's the next step of obedience. And God shows you that light. And you see that light and you say, no, I'm not going to do that. And then you wonder why things stop in your Christian life. There's no more light coming in. You say, God, what's going on? How come I can't understand this? How come I can't see this? If you're having trouble understanding certain things in the Bible, you're having trouble, you feel like you're kind of plugged up in your Christian life, you ought to stop and say, have I refused the light somewhere? Have I stopped obeying God somewhere? Have I said, well, God, not that? I'm not going to do that? Maybe you need to surrender that. Maybe you need to receive that truth, accept it, and let God continue then to open up and give you more light. There's a day of reckoning coming, and we'll all stand, we'll all give account before God. Some people say, well, if our sins are forgiven, it's not about the sins. It's about you refusing the light that God gave to you. And he knows what light he's given to each of us. And listen, don't 
I wonder sometimes, you know, Jesus told his disciples when they go into a place and preach the gospel, if they don't listen to you, shake the dust off your feet. And I, I wonder sometimes when you get to heaven, if, or at the, at the unsaved, when they're at the judgment seat, and I wonder if, if there's people you witness to, people you gave the gospel to and they didn't accept Christ. I wonder if God will, will have Bob Wallace's shoes there and shake the dust on them. You know what I mean? And guys will say, remember, remember him when he gave you the gospel and you said no? God will shake the dust off. See, it, they're going to be accountable for the light they refused. And so will we. So will we. And so don't, don't turn your back. All men have some light. Light refused increases darkness. Light obeyed increases light. And men will be judged in eternity according to the light they obeyed. And according to the light they had. Four factors that affect eternity. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth this morning. Lord, just something that's been on my heart. I wanted to help our folks to understand. And Lord, not only the, the truth about the heathen and why we have to get the gospel to them, why we believe that what the scripture says, there's no other name whereby they can be saved. They must hear about Jesus Christ. We must get the gospel to every creature. And Lord, there's those who are crying out. They're, they're trying to act on the light they have. And Lord, use us to get more light to them. But yet, Lord, this morning I'm not just preaching for those folks who are not here and those folks who are unreached in the world. The message was to the people in this room about whether they're obeying the light that you've given to them. Some are groping in darkness this morning because they refuse to obey the light you gave them. And the light's gone out. And they know it. I pray you'd minister to their heart today. Help them to fall on their knees and say, God, I want to obey you. Whatever you shine the light on, I'm going to obey. Your word will be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will walk in the light as you are in the light. Minister to hearts today. And if any today, Lord, has never received Christ as their Savior, I pray they'd receive Him as their Savior this morning. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. We'll have our invitation. God has spoken to your heart today and want to give you opportunity to respond to Him. I wonder how many folks in the room would say, Hey, Pastor, there's a time in my life when I knew I was a sinner I knew I needed a Savior. I knew Jesus was a Savior I needed. Someone told me about Jesus, and I called on Him, and I asked Him to be my Savior. And Pastor, I know I'm saved today. I know I have eternal life. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment? Say, Pastor, I know that I'm saved. Okay, you may put it down. Is there anybody here today who would say, Pastor, I'm not sure. If I died, I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure that I'm saved. Would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up? And just say, pray for me, Pastor. Just put it up and put it back down. I'll see it. Okay, I didn't think I saw anybody's hand that didn't go up. And the message was to believers this morning. Now the question for you, believer, is this. How many of you this morning would say, Pastor, I think I've not obeyed the light that God has given me. But the Lord has pricked my heart this morning. And I do want to obey the light. I don't want the light to become darkness. I want to, I want more light, not less light. And I know that's obedience on my part. And Pastor, God has spoken to my heart this morning. I want to receive it. I don't want to refuse it. Pray for me this morning. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. If you're here today and 
you're saved and you've never taken that step of obedience for baptism, you ought to come and say, Pastor, you know what? I want to obey the Lord and be baptized. Maybe you're saved, you're baptized, and you don't belong. You ought to come and say, you know what? We need to belong. We want to be a part of Bible Baptist Church and serve the Lord. Or whatever it is that the Lord has spoken to your heart about, he's, 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 he's pricked your heart. Respond to him this morning. And say, Lord, whatever, name that thing, whatever it is, and say, I'm going to obey. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey the light you've given to me. I want to please you in all I do. Father, thank you for speaking to hearts this morning. Have your way in this invitation now. I pray that each individual will do what you're bidding them to do in their heart. And holy decisions we made for you this morning at these altars. And we'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, the pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning. Will you please? Oh, to Jesus I surrender. Oh, to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender Jesus, I surrender, humbly at his feet I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee. Blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer now. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts today. Thank you for being a wonderful God to us. Thank you, Lord, for the light you've given to us. We have so much, and Lord, we know to whom much is given, much will be required. So Lord, help us to walk in the light today as you were in the light, so we can have fellowship one with another. Give us a good Sunday afternoon, prepare our hearts, bring us back this evening, Lord, for an evening service. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Look forward to seeing you here tonight. Don't forget the fellowship afterwards tonight. Ladies, don't forget to sign up downstairs for the... Uh, bridal shower for amber on saturday and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you back here this evening let's sing together i'm so glad i'm a part of the family of god brother bob i'm so glad i'm a part of the family of god i've been washed in the fountain cleansed by his blood jointed with jesus as we travel this side for I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight. <laughs>